Professor Polly Toad here, and welcome to today's lesson. Sinnoh, a region that has a special place in my heart, as well as many others. The fourth generation of games introduced Pokemon to the DS, and they remain some of the most popular games in the franchise. I remember ever since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire released, the phrase Sinnoh Remakes Confirmed made its way around every circle of the internet it could. And now we are coming up to the one year anniversary of the release of Legends Arceus, which was such an interesting game on release, and it was a huge step forward into the open world genre of games. Arceus takes place in the Hisui region, a setting far back in time, the past of what is known as the Sinnoh region. As most players were searching for all the wisps, finding their next shiny, or training their next level 100, I was obsessed over something completely different. With Hisui and Sinnoh, we now have a look into the, what the Sinnoh region looked like in the past, and I wanted to find and talk about all of the different geomorphological changes between the Hisui region and the Sinnoh region. In real life, Earth is always shifting and moving its continents, which is known as the theory of plate tectonics. Because we have a look into Sinnoh's past, I wanted to see the movement of plates within the Sinnoh region by comparing the differences between the Hisui map and the Sinnoh map, and then to further compare those differences to how Hokkaido actually formed, the real world location Sinnoh was based on. Doing this then took me down an entire rabbit hole of geological investigation and interpretation, which is the subject of today's lesson. First, I wanted to compare the two Pokemon regions by breaking them up into three different sections and to make observations with as unbiased an opinion as possible. So for the sake of comparison today, I'm only going to compare the fourth generation games Diamond and Pearl to Legends Arceus. Although we do have Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, which are the Sinnoh remakes, I wasn't the biggest fan of them to be perfectly honest. Although they did bring a lot to the table in terms of accessibility for those who want to play the Sinnoh games, uh, Diamond and Pearl for the DS can be hard to come by these days. Accessibility was probably the main thing that Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl brought. BDSP, or as I like to call them BDSM, seem to be a fun time before you start playing them, but then after an hour or so you realize that your balls hurt and you can't sit down properly. So, ow. Damn. <clears throat> oh. Anyways, first I wanted to look at the western region of Sinnoh and Hisui. The first difference I noticed was that the hills and the mountains in Sinnoh are much more rounded and smaller than the Hisui region. This can be seen on the two maps, as well as the significant height differences between the Hisui and Sinnoh landscapes in game, like how there are towering hills in Hisui and just small lumps in the Sinnoh. My thought is that this is a product of consistent physical weathering processes that have worn down the Hisuian mountains down into the flatter hills of Sinnoh, much like the Great Dividing Mountain Range in eastern Australia. Looking further north, Floroma Town and everything past is covered in snow on the Hisui map, where we know in Sinnoh this is an area of lush warm forests and flowers. In Platinum, we know that snow can be found practically everywhere, as snow is found in Twinleaf Town. This is most likely seasonal differences expressed artistically, as the coastal mountain range in BC Canada will have snow in the winter months and fields of wildflowers in the spring and summer. Another theory to explain the significant increase in snow in Hisui is that Hisui is experiencing an Ice Age-like event. This can also explain the shortening and rounding of mountains in Sinnoh, as all across Canada, the Ice Age of 10,000 BC caused many land masses to become flattened and rounded, and this is an effect we can still see today. Here you can see some of the rounded areas caused by glacial movement, and the lines found on the rock surfaces are called glacial striations, and show the direction the glaciers traveled. Oh Jesus, it's windy out today. Hey, how's it going everybody? Ah. Uh, here we are outside, uh, here to take a look at some uh, glacial rounding of outcrops and some glacial striations. It's a beautiful, lovely day up here in northern Ontario, but uh, and unfortunately we're going to have to dig through the snow to get to our, uh, to our rocks, so let's get going. You know, I might not have chosen the best day, but at least the sun's out, so that's nice. So you can kind of see it appearing already, and just imagine this outcrop comes from just behind the camera, and it goes all the way, like 
500 meters that way. A long, big outcrop. But here we got some, uh, some of our nice features, so let's take a look at it. So here's our clear outcrop. Uh, it's a little small patch, but you can see it's quite flat all around this outcrop. This was uh, because when the, glacier, when the glacier came over, ripped up all the rock on top, made it, small, uh, made it flat, just like this. And we can see evidence of that from these glacial striations right here. They're a little hard to see, but they're these lines. They're a little uh, accentuated by the snow right now. But as you can see, these lines right here, they kind of cut stop up, up in here. But these lines that are moving in that direction, those are our glacial striations, and they denote the movement of the glacier. And so for our key, uh, our keen eye viewers, you might be like, you might say to yourself, but there are these lines here. They're going in a very complete opposite direction. But what are those lines? And that's particularly why I chose this outcrop because these, this rock is a meta sedimentary sand. You know? And so um, these are actually bedding planes. In the southwest area of Sand Gem and Pal Park, we can see river systems coming from the central mountain chain and depositing it into the ocean. This is most likely a sedimentary zone, specifically a delta, where river sediment is deposited into a much larger body of water, typically an ocean. This sediment will build up over time and eventually it will start to protrude out of the larger body of water to create land masses. Some real world examples of this are the Mississippi Delta just south of New Orleans in Louisiana as well as the Fraser River Delta of Vancouver, Canada. This thought is further explained based on there being more land mass in the area in Sinnoh than in Hisui. The most interesting difference I found in the area was Iron Island. In Hisui, Iron Island is just a peninsula, whereas in Sinnoh, the land mass is an island, hence the name. Somehow, this piece of land must have moved, which will touch on my plate tectonic theory that I will discuss later on in the video. For the northern area, in general, there is no real large mainland difference between the Hisui and Sinnoh regions, however, there is a difference in the Stark Mountain between the maps. Stark Mountain and the surrounding area is much larger in Sinnoh than it is in Hisui, and the simplest explanation is consistent volcanic activity over time, with a few more details I will go in later in the video, as it ties into my plate tectonic theory. For the eastern area, starting with Hartholm in Pastoria City, this area is most likely a sedimentary delta area, evident by the river passing through the area and the illustration of farming. Deltas typically are very arable farmland, such as the Fraser River Delta in Vancouver, BC, where a huge portion of the lower mainland between Chilliwack and Richmond is dedicated farmland. As well, in the Hisui region, the Crimson Mirelands is a very wet and sandy place, otherwise known as the Bog. Salation Town and the Salation Ruins appear to be unchanged on both maps. The largest change of the eastern area is the Veilstone and Sunny Shore coastline. In both Sinnoh and Hisui, the coastlines are drastically different, which also applies to my plate tectonic theory. But on both maps, there is a large rounded section to the coastline, which is where I want to introduce another theory of mine, my crackpot theory of a meteor impact site, which I will call the Sunny Shore impact structure. Earth is no stranger to meteor impacts, where it is estimated around 500 meteors reach the Earth's surface each year, albeit these are very small meteors. However, there is always the smallest chance a significantly larger meteor will hit the Earth's surface, leaving a large crater when all the dust settles. We can see similarly rounded structures like this caused by meteor impacts all across the planet, such as the Sudbury Basin in Ontario, Canada, the Manicouagan Reservoir in Quebec, Canada, and the Yucatan Crater in Mexico, the impact site that is theorized to have caused the dinosaur extinction, ushering in the end of the Cretaceous period. Other evidence to support this theory is the raised rock material surrounding the structure of the Hisui map, as typically rock material gets displaced when a large meteor strikes the Earth. As well as in Veilstone City, you can find four meteorites in-game that change Deoxys' form, but they are very close to the edge of the Sunny Shore impact structure, not necessarily in the center. 
I love this theory. I'm a big fan of this theory. How cool is it to say that, yeah, it was just a meteor that did that. Shit's dope when talking about geology. It's pretty cool, but unfortunately, as many theories go, this probably is not the case. Alrighty, now I believe I have teased you quite enough, so let's get into my plate tectonics theory. This is what really inspired me into thinking about the geology and geomorphology of the Sinnoh region. This was considering how the central mountain chain formed. In essence, orogeny, or mountain building, is a product of subduction. In terms of how plates are interacting with each other, these are the three main types. Subduction zones are a type of convergent boundary where two plates are moving towards each other, where one plate will slide underneath the other. This can be seen on the western coast of North America, where the Pacific plate is subducting underneath the North American plate. When a plate subducts underneath the other, rock material is forced upwards to form mountains. An example of this is the Burgess Shale within the Rocky Mountain Range in British Columbia. This is a famous fossil bed found on top of the mountains of Yoho National Park, containing many different and rare marine species of the Cambrian period, 500 million years ago. Now, you may ask yourself, how did marine fossils reach the top of a mountain range? This is because as the Pacific Plate subducted underneath the North American Plate, the fossil beds on the ocean floor were pushed upwards, along with the other rock material, forming that mountain range and depositing the fossils on top of the mountains. For starters, we can infer that there are at least two plates within the Sinnoh region, as these are the two plates that are converging to form the central Mount Coronet mountain range. When we further examine the Hisui and Sinnoh maps, we can see movement of Iron Island from a peninsula to an island, as well as the movement of Veilstone Cape to form Victory Road. This movement suggests there is a presence of a third plate, moving northeast away from the mainland of Sinnoh. Going back to my sunny shore impact structure theory, it is possible that the meteor impact broke the plates to form a third, or there are always three plates to begin with, and the impact had no influence on the plate tectonics of Sinnoh whatsoever. I've decided to define these plates as the WSP, or Western Sinnoh Plate, ESP, or Eastern Sinnoh Plate, and the NSP, or Northern Sinnoh Plate. But, Professor Polytoad, since you suggested that Hisui is experiencing an Ice Age-like event, isn't it possible that the melting of ice and snow raised the ocean water levels, sinking parts of the mainland to have peninsulas become islands? Interesting point, and entirely possible. However, I must disagree with you. First, even though I did theorize that Hisui is experiencing an Ice Age event, I don't actually think that this is the case for Hisui, which I will touch on when I talk about how Hokkaido actually formed. And second, Stark Mountain is actually moving. So, how is Stark Mountain moving? Well, let's now talk about seamount chains. Hawaii is an American state that happens to be a chain of volcanic islands that is known as a seamount chain. A seamount is a formation of rock that occurs on the ocean floor where a super hot body of magma is stationary in the mantle underneath the Earth's crust and is pushing its way upwards. This causes the ocean floor to bulge upwards and in some cases breach the ocean surface to form an island, which is how Hawaii has formed. Now, for Hawaii specifically, the seamount chain is called the Emperor Hawaiian Seamount Chain and appears mostly as a scar on the Pacific Plate, with the end being the Hawaiian Islands. As the Pacific Plate is moving, this stationary hotspot of magma is pushing up rock material as the plates move over top. There are other seamount chains visible on the ocean floor, such as these three below India, showing that the Indian Plate has moved towards the Eurasian Plate, colliding together to form the Himalayan Mountains. And so the easiest way to explain how seamount chains work is to use a piece of paper and a pen just like this. So we're going to pretend that the piece of paper here is our plate, and the pen is our hotspot underneath it. And so it's supposed to look just like that. So there's our hotspot, and this is our plate that's moving around the hotspot. So for the sake of diagramming, I'm going to have it look like this. And so here is our starting point for our hotspot. And so as the plate is moving towards uh, Russia or Alaska, whichever direction it's moving, we can. S and if you want to pretend that towards my head is the direction of the plate movement, the plate's moving up but the hotspot is stationary, and as it's forcing magma and rock material upwards, it's creating this scar on the bottom of the ocean floor, which is what is a seamount chain. As well as we can, tra we can use this to track the movement of plates, much like how the Emperor seamount chain has a much drastic change in direction, we can see that if the plate wants to go this way, we can see the hotspot is creating that scar, continuing along the direction of plate movement. 
as well. And if the plate just moves up this way, we, we're creating this really funky lightning shape to it. But in essence, that's what an Emperor C mount chain is. Looking at Stark Mountain in Hisui, we can see that it's just a relatively small volcanic island, with the entire island just being the beginnings of the volcano. Comparing the landmass to the Sinnoh Games, there is no question that Stark Mountain and the surrounding area is significantly bigger than it is in Hisui. There are literally three towns on the island, it's so much bigger. This size increase can be easily explained by consistent volcanic activity, which I agree with, but I wanted to look closer at the entire mountain range that Stark Mountain is contained in. See how there are similarly sized mountains to the north of Stark Mountain, and much smaller ones towards the south? This would show that the NSP is moving north, as volcanic activity would be occurring in the opposite direction of plate movements, much like how the Emperor's Seamount chain is. As such, I can say with confidence that the NSP is indeed moving and not experiencing rising sea levels. Now, I want to touch on why my sunny shore impact structure theory is disproved by volcanism. The three lakes in Sinnoh, Acuity, Verity, and Valor, are what are known as caldera lakes. A caldera is a ring formed by a volcano at surface and will continue to grow bigger as volcanic activity increases. In some cases, dormant volcanoes that have only just formed the initial ring will collect water in their basin like a bowl, and if the water has nowhere to drain, a lake is formed. This is what is known as a caldera lake. We know Sinnoh has a significant amount of volcanic activity, as such most circular structures are most likely calderas, as this is the simplest explanation. This would include Sendoff Spring and the circular structure I originally thought was an impact site. If Sinnoh and Hisui were real world locations we could go to, we could look for other evidence of an impact such as shatter cones and the mineral stichovite. Shatter cones are a rock structure that forms from waves of high energy that pass through the rock and create these triangular shaped structures. Think of it like throwing a rock into a frozen pond. As the, ro as the rock impacts into the ice, the cracks and the fractures that occur from the waves of energy that are passing through are the shatter cones that form as the meteor impacts bedrock. Here we are back out in the in back outside. And uh, here we're now we're looking at some shatter cones, a little far away, but we'll get a nice close up shot right here. But these, this structure right here, you can see there's a giant big one coming up right here, as well as there's a little tiny one just right here. And uh, yeah, so these are our shatter cones. This is the uh, when the meteorite impacts and the waves of energy are moving through uh, the crust. This is what's left over, much like a ripple marks or uh, or fractures in ice or ripple marks in water, just like that. And as you can see, here's our close up of our shatter cones. This one right here is our little tiny one, little big guy right here. You can see the lines radiating out from the center or the bottom of the cone. And you can see a much larger one right here as this is the point of the cone all coming up this way. So all these lines and there's a couple of little tiny ones in here as well as one up here. But those are shatter cones. So the mineral stichovite is another piece of evidence that supports an impact. This is a quartz SiO2 polymorph that has been structurally altered by the ripples of high energy that pass through it, similarly to how shatter cones form. As we can't see any of this in game, Keeping it simple shows that this is most likely a caldera and not likely an impact. Now, let's move on to how Hokkaido actually formed. Hokkaido is the large island located to the north of Japan and is the real world location that Hisui and Sinnoh are based on. The island started to form around 140 million years ago during the Cretaceous period by the collision of the Eurasian Plate and the Pacific Plate. This convergence created a subduction zone as the Pacific Plate slid underneath the Eurasian Plate, which we can see this movement by tracing the Emperor Hawaiian Seamount chain. Over the next 137 million years, rock material was forced upwards to form Hokkaido and the rest of Japan. Not only is rock material forced upwards at a convergent plate boundary, but also the magma underneath the crust, which is why there is a significant amount of volcanic activity in the area. This plate movement caused the creation of a large volcanic chain that runs throughout Japan and continues further south to the Philippines along the plate boundary. Hokkaido also has residual byproducts of volcanic activity. As mentioned before, the three lakes in Sinnoh are based on caldera lakes found in similar locations where they would be situated in Sinnoh. Hokkaido also has a variety of different rock types found across the island, mostly sedimentary and igneous rocks with a minor amount of metamorphic rocks. These are the three types.
So probably one of my favorite things to do in the Sinnoh region was using the Explorer's Kit and going underground and mining. And mining is a critical aspect of geology, as it's the easiest way to know what the rocks look like below the Earth's surface. And so when you go underground in the Sinnoh region, you can find crystals, otherwise known as spheres, as well as fossils. Touching on the fossils first, we can mine fossils from Gen 1 to Gen 4 in the Sinnoh games. Hokkaido is a host to a large number of fossils dating back 100 million years ago, with the oldest being an ammonite. These fossil beds are located in the sedimentary zones of Hokkaido, but mostly in the western sedimentary zone. The spheres found in the underground are probably what interests me the most because we can determine real-world minerals that the spheres are representative of. First, let's look at the mineralogical properties that these spheres possess. As we can't look at these spheres in real life, we can't do a proper mineralogical analysis. However, the images and in-game properties can give us some clues to narrow down the mineral. The three properties that we can see are the luster. This is how well the mineral reflects light. The sprite art for the spheres show them to be very reflective, as well as they sparkle when they are located, as well as when they are mined out. Thus, the mineral must have a highly reflective luster. The second property is the habit. This is the shape of how the crystal grows. As the spheres are spheres, the mineral must have a botryoidal crystal habit. Botryoidal is the Greek word for grape-like and is probably my favorite crystal habit of them all. And finally, our third property is the color. Although this seems so simple in retrospect, this is an important feature in determining what the mineral is. Now that we have our three mineralogical properties that help us determine which spheres are representative of certain minerals, now let's apply them. For the red sphere, this is most likely hematite. For the blue sphere, this is most likely azurite. For the green sphere, this is most likely malachite. And for the pale sphere, this is most likely quartz variety chalcedony. To any geologists or rock hounds who are watching, the argument can be made about the spheres are actually represented by agate, a layered and spherical variety of quartz. Botryoidal crystals tend to grow in groups of spheres, whereas agate is just a singular crystal, much like what is found in the games. I must agree, however, all of the spheres being different colors of quartz is just boring to me. Alrighty, so here I am in my university mineralogy lab and I just wanted to show you what these minerals actually look like. I had some photos that I've attached into the video to, so you guys know what these minerals look like, but I figured why not bring you into my lab so, we can show, so I can show you what these rocks look like. So here we've got, well it's a good portion, it's orange and blue. That's our azurite. Don't worry, I'll be giving us a, a close-up of all these rocks. They're kind of hard to see from that far away. This is our azurite. This is our blue sphere representative mineral. Right here we have malachite. It's a little green. Uh, this is our green representative sphere. Here we have quartz variety chalcedony. This is our pale sphere. As well as here we have hematite, which is our red sphere. So starting with our uh, quartz variety chalcedony. This is our pale sphere. As you can see, you've got these little bumps right here. This is our botryoidal crystal growth right there. You can see a giant bump right there. Little tiny ones in here, giant one in there. And that's our, that's our chalcedony, representing our pale sphere. And so here we have azurite, which is representing our blue sphere. And a good portion of this has all been oxidized. That's what all of this orange uh, coloration in the rock is, but all of the blue stuff, as you can see in here, and here, there, there, and this giant little big piece right in the middle, that's our azurite. And you can see, going back to the botryoidal crystal growth, this, this guy's covered in these little bumps, these little spherical bumps. That's our botryoidal crystal texture. And so here we have our hematite, which is representative of our red sphere. So all of this entire chunk is just all hematite. As you can see with this little tiny bit right here, it's kind of hard to see with this one, but this one is covered in our botryoidal crystal growth texture. Now you may be thinking to yourself, but, but that looks so black, how can this be red? Well, if you look on the other side, hematite is actually starts to stain red once it starts oxidizing. So that's what that red coloration is from. And so here now we have our malachite, which is representing our green sphere. Now unfortunately my mineralogy lab doesn't have the best samples when it comes to botryoidal texture in malachite, however it still fits. This is, this is what malachite will normally look like and it kind of looks like this little crust that grows out over top of these, over top of this rock. Just a quick little interesting fact I wanted to share with you guys. 
Since azurite and malachite are both copper carbonate minerals, they tend to form together. As you can see, this little green patch in a majority of azurite is malachite. And if we look at our older sample from, uh, from the malachite, a good portion of this is malachite. However, if you just turn it over and you see these blue specks, that's azurite. Based on the mineralogical properties observed, I think that these real-life minerals are as perfect as they can be for representation. Further evidence is the existence of iron and copper deposits in Hokkaido, and is host to multiple deposits that could host these specific minerals, such as the Shimokawa copper mine and the multiple VMS or volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits that host specifically hematite. SiO2 or quartz is the most common mineral in the Earth's crust, so it's a pretty good assumption that quartz can be found in Hokkaido as it can be found everywhere else in the world. And so for those of you who have an excellent memory, you might be saying to yourself, but what about the prism sphere? You didn't talk about the prism sphere. Well, if you look at the in-game sprite, you can actually see there are five sides to the crystal. This is an important detail to recognize because this is an impossible crystal. It shouldn't exist. This crystal does not exist. I'm telling you, it is not possible to have this crystal. So now let me explain. Mineral growth occurs by one of five different shapes, and these are defined by the rotational axes and mirror planes of crystal faces. Looking at the prism sphere, this crystal has five faces, showing that the mineral would have a five-fold rotational axis. This is what a one-fold looks like, a two-fold, a three-fold, a four-fold, and a six-fold. For the five-fold rotational axis, this is energetically unfavorable for crystals to grow this way, which makes crystals with five faces impossible to grow naturally. You can think of crystal growth like an M.C. Escher painting, where all the individual pieces of crystal unit cells fit together like a puzzle. However, having pieces with five sides invites spaces or gaps between the unit cells, which is energetically unfavorable and destabilizes the crystal structure. You can also see this in the crystals scattered around Hisui, the orange, blue, and black ones. They all have the same crystal faces, most likely because they all share the same model but with different colors and textures, and you can see that there are five faces on the crystal columns. These are also impossible crystal growth patterns, but for the sake of analysis, let's just assume these are different varieties of quartz. Sinnoh also hosts a large coal deposit situated in the town of Orberg. 90% of the world's coal comes from the Carboniferous period, or the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian periods for any Americans watching which occurred 360 to 300 million years ago. The coal comes from constant burial of organic plant matter, which was unable to decompose due to the lack of microorganisms, which also increases the temperature and pressure of the deeper layers as the organic material goes deeper, forming the carbon material into coal. Orberg is situated where carboniferous sediments are found in Hokkaido, as well as its coal fields, showing that coal would also be found in Sinnoh. Now, let's summarize. To summarize, all I really proved was that the geology and geomorphology of the Sinnoh and Hisui regions are quite similar to how Hokkaido actually formed. The one thing I don't understand is the game design, and how the time change between the Hisui and Sinnoh regions are never stated, but it is inferred to be about 200 years. This inferred time gap could be interpreted to be larger, however there are characters in Hisui like Volo, who are supposed to be relatives of characters in Sinnoh, like Cynthia. In retrospect, 200 years is solidly 5 to 6 generations of family members. The inferred time gap cannot be too large, otherwise these families would start to look different from each other. I do want to express though that I'm not a biologist, I'm a geologist, so Punnett squares and genetics are 100% not my field of study. Another reason why the time gap doesn't make sense to me is the plate tectonics. As shown before, the plates that I've plotted out do show movement. However, Plate tectonics don't normally work that fast, and they are really, really, really slow. Like the fastest a plate has ever moved in a year is 10 centimeters, and even then, they typically move much, much slower. With the movements visible on the Sinnoh map, this isn't movement that has occurred over a few hundred years, but is most likely at least at 1 million years. Lastly, and for the third time, let's bring up the Ice Age. The last Ice Age to occur on Earth was about 10,000 years ago. And according to this visual, the formed ice was nowhere near Japan at the time of the event. Even if it was, and there was evidence to support Hisui is experiencing Ice Age event, 10,000 years is a significantly larger time gap than 200, so it would be even more unlikely to have similar looking relatives. And 10,000 years is not enough time for plates to move. So, to be brief, the geology of this 
matches up quite well. However, the time gap does not. Hi, thank you for staying to the end of my TED talk. I hope you learned something new about rocks in the earth. I always find that we think of rocks such as simple entities. A rock is a rock is a rock is a rock is a rock. But the science and detail behind them is so vast and intricate, I'm always learning new things about them. I wanted to give a shout out to everybody who helped inspire me to finish this video. A little bit of a, bit of a, it was a bit of a long project now that I'm back in school, but I'm glad I finished this and I hope you all learned something. Uh, leave a comment down below if you did learn anything new and I hope to see you in the next one.